Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. All right, good morning, everyone. I'm gonna get us started here. Thanks for joining the 12th annual C Forum's 12th and final webinar, leveraging solar and battery systems to lower costs and increase resiliency, featuring our sponsor, Terra Verde Energy. This year's forum is funded and sponsored by 3C Ren, Bay Ren, and Southern California Ren. And we'd also like to thank our additional sponsors, Terra Verde Energy, the Energy Coalition, and TRC. And also just a quick shout out to our promo partners for helping us tremendously with outreach. All right, just to go over our Zoom housekeeping real quick, please do use the Q&A box uh, to submit any questions that you may have for our speakers throughout the presentation. We'll have some time for a Q&A at the end. Um, please also use the upvoting option that really helps us prioritize which questions to ask. And please also use our chat box to communicate with other participants, introduce yourself, or reach out to LGC staff if you have any technical issues. All right, and now I want to pass it on to David Burdick, our moderator for this webinar, who is the Executive Vice President at Terra Verde Energy. Thanks for joining us, David. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, Serena. Good morning, everybody. And Thanks for joining us for this uh, webinar as part of the series of the Local Government Commission's SEEK Forum. And we've been a proud sponsor and participant in the SEEK Forum for years and our fingers crossed looking forward to potentially an in-person event coming next year, we'll see. Uh, but uh, glad we're able to connect virtually through this platform and continue this very important conversation. Um, as Serena mentioned, we're gonna be talking today about how local governments can leverage solar and battery systems to both lower energy costs and increase resiliency. And uh, today I'm joined by my colleague, CEO of Terra Verde, Ali Chaharishaz, uh, who's gonna be joining us at the back half of the presentation talking about these topics, about these important resources and the decisions and considerations that local governments uh, should be thinking about in the days that we're facing today. Um, but to give you a sense of who we are at Terra Verde, we're an independent consulting firm who've been proudly working with California public agencies going on 12 years now, and have spent a lot of our efforts helping teams think through and then deploy their strategies for solar, for battery, and then increasingly now energy resiliency projects. And today's session, we're going to be basically breaking up into two different categories. We want to first talk about what are some considerations for new project opportunities? So if your team has already deployed some of these resources, but you're thinking about a, a subsequent phase, what are your new project opportunities? Maybe you haven't yet started deploying these types of resources. Uh, there's great uh, context and great market updates here for you today. And then I'll be passing it to Ali, who's gonna be talking about some of the considerations for agencies that already have some existing resources, because what we're seeing in the landscape is that there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of emerging challenges as well as opportunities for agencies that have existing solar. Uh, so without further ado, let's dive right in uh, to considerations for new project opportunities. So first to just set some context here, uh, solar PV systems are a relatively understood technology deployed by so many as a cost saving strategy. I think by now, a lot of folks realize that by deploying solar electricity on site, you can uh, increase your sustainability, you can uh, drive towards that clean energy future, but it, it's also understood these technologies also reduce utility electricity costs. They reduce your electricity bills. Uh, and that's been a proven concept over the years. But what is a little known uh, element to these resources is that solar PV systems can also generate revenues now uh, through monetizing what are known as renewable energy certificates. Uh, these certificates, they represent the uh, environmental attributes associated with your uh, solar generation. And uh, these can be traded in the marketplace and monetized to create uh, a nice recurring revenue stream. And historically in California, these renewable energy certificates have been valued at lower price points on a per unit basis. And for a lot of teams was overlooked in terms of engaging and monetizing these recs. But what we're seeing now uh, is over recent years, there's been a substantial increase in the value of these recs 
And now we're supporting our clients with monetizing those recs, which in some cases means uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in annual recurring revenue off of their existing solar projects. Uh, so not only are these cost savings resources, they're also revenue generating resources. Battery energy storage systems is a newer story. Um, although hitting the stage really en masse going say five to seven years ago, uh, battery energy storage systems um, are increasingly being called upon now um, as a backup power resource, which we'll talk about in a minute. But uh, these not only provide backup power to facilities, but they can also be leveraged as a cost savings resource. Um, batteries are able to take your solar generated electricity and store that electricity and then use that electricity in the evening um, as the pricing within the energy markets has shifted to put a higher value on electricity in the evenings. Solar generation, the value of that generation can be improved by taking that generation, storing it until those evening hours and then be discharged to generate even more value in the form of cost savings. Um, and so that's a huge consideration for teams as they're thinking about their energy programs is how might we use battery energy storage systems to improve our solar, to reduce our costs. But batteries are really interesting from a revenue perspective because they're such a flexible technology. They can, they can on demand take electricity in and on demand reduce, uh, release that electricity either to the facility or to the grid. That flexible uh, capacity is really interesting um, on the, the wholesale market side of the equation. And so in, increasingly we're seeing opportunities for behind the meter resources like batteries to be able to participate in programs where they can provide grid services, either through utility programs or through emerging programs coming from community choice aggregators. And typically there are revenues that can be generated either from simply participating in the program passively or in some cases, actively charging and discharging, responding to signals. And so these are both savings and revenue generating resources. And to give you a sense of the, the scale of what we're talking about in terms of project value, uh, we recently celebrated with one of our clients, a, a county in Northern California, uh, the commissioning of their recent project that is, is expected over a 25 year term to deliver $2.3 million in value to the county. You can see here the specs for this project. It's a modestly sized uh, solar system at 600 kilowatts and a, a moderately sized battery energy storage system at 464 kilowatt hours. Um, under the terms of a 25 year power purchase agreement, these projects are deployed on site with no capital cost requirements to the county to deploy those systems. These projects are financed by the third party. They deliver these resources and the savings and the revenue benefits from these resources and then are charging a, a monthly rate uh, for these services delivered by these technologies. But you can see here over a 25 year term, these resources are expected to generate $4.5 million of value in terms of just bill savings. They're gonna end up paying somewhere around the 2.4 million mark for the uh, payments of these agreements to pay for that value and for these resources. You can see here, there's that uh, re revenue stream projected modestly at $200,000 uh, for this project, yielding a net financial benefit of that 2.3 million over a 25 year term. And so in many cases, local governments can deploy these resources at no cost and see substantial savings uh, from solar and battery systems. And with you know, smoke-filled skies today in California, uh, we're constantly reminded of our need uh, for not only cheaper electricity, but also more reliable electricity. We've seen the emergence of these wildfire-related power shutoff events with increasing severity and frequency of these heat waves that are sitting on our state, causing tremendous strain on the grid and then uh, initiating rolling blackouts. Um, we, we, need, we need a more reliable resource set uh, when we think about our electricity. And so when paired with the proper switching and controls, solar and battery resources uh, can not only reduce your cost, but also increase your resiliency and provide backup power during these outages. Uh, but in an important piece of the picture of these projects, as you're thinking about the backup power concept is how do you put a dollar value against having those kinds of resources on site at your facilities? What is the financial value 
of backup power. Um, you can see that these outages can be so costly depending on your agency's operations. Um, for one of our school district clients in Northern California, um, in their particular case, we evaluated this question. And when the power goes out at their sites for more than six hours, they're required by law to dispose of their refrigerated and frozen foods. And so as a school operation, they've got a ton of food stored at several locations. As we take stock of all of those sites and how much those perishables are valued at in terms of the cost to replace that, over these five sites, this one school district, every time the power goes off for more than six hours, the spoilage is a cost of nearly a quarter million dollars. So these costs can be incredibly substantial. And you think not just of schools and spoilage, but you think of other operations, business interruption costs, you think of other uh, costs for, for losing power for critical facilities in your community. And uh, this can be a real challenge for teams is to think through how can we defensively account for the actual costs of a power outage and therefore bring those costs into the value of the project to deploy these solar and battery resources. And so seeing this need to come up with a, a clear methodology for, for coming up with that value, Terra Verde has developed what we're calling our economic value of resilience model or our EVOR model which is our defensible accounting methodology for quantifying the financial benefits of having these backup power resources. And to put simply, what is this EVOR model? It is a, a, a study and then a, a projection of, number one, the avoided costs of otherwise applicable solutions. And so thinking about, uh, for example, diesel generators and the cost to deploy those, the costs to uh, not just deploy, but then to operate and maintain those, including the permitting uh, costs and the fuel costs. And so looking at that resource set and thinking, how can we avoid those costs through the deployment of clean energy resilient technologies? And then coupling with that, these avoided costs of power interruption, which again, could be business interruption costs. In some cases, there's been observed damages to electrical equipment when the power is either shut off or when it resumes power. It could be IT system damages, productivity losses, et cetera. And so um, Terra Verde is pleased to announce that as of this week, our client, uh, one of our clients, uh, their board approved a contract for their microgrid projects, their solar plus battery enabled backup power projects, which were uh, developed using this EVOR methodology uh, to account for the value of their projects. And so we're thrilled to see that you know, there's this need to be able to understand this value, but beyond that, actually go get projects done, leveraging that knowledge. And that's really what Terra Verde is about, is to help you understand your needs, understand the opportunity, and then get stuff done uh, in the name of cl cheaper, cleaner, more reliable electricity. Uh, some good news, there are substantial incentives available to help your team pay for these projects, uh, but those incentives are moving super quickly. Um, so to start first on the federal level, there is the, the longstanding investment tax credit. This is a, an incentive that provides a tax benefit of 26% of the total costs of a solar project or a solar plus battery project. Currently, standalone storage projects or adding batteries to existing solar projects don't yet qualify for this incentive. There's a lot of movement happening on the federal level to try to change that to where batteries can get access to this directly. But right now, solar projects and solar plus battery projects can get access to this tax credit. And for local governments, this value can get monetized into your project through a third party ownership agreement where a company or a, a, a firm with the tax appetite can provide you with a project agreement where they monetize these tax credits and then pass that through to you in the form of reduced agreement payments. And uh, while this is a rich incentive and it's had a long successful track record, the value of this incentive is gonna begin stepping down annually um, starting next year. So projects commencing construction through next year get 26% in terms of a benefit. That value drops to 22% starting 2023, and then it drops down to 10% in years 2024 and beyond for commercial scale projects. For residential scale projects is on track to, to be wiped out utterly to 0%. Again, there's some movement happening at the federal level to see some changes to this program, to increase the value, to extend the life of it. But under the current market conditions, it's important to move swiftly to lock down this incentive while it's at its richest. 
Another program that's garnered a lot of attention in the state of California is the Self-Generation Incentive Program or SGIP. And this is a battery incentive program. It also incentivizes other technologies, but the bullets of the funding moving through this program is targeting batteries and increasingly batteries that are being leveraged for energy resiliency and for backup power. And so for public agencies that are thinking about batteries, there are multiple levels of incentives available through this program. There is the base level incentive. It's known as the large scale budget. And that's available to all public agencies. It's available to all customers of investor owned utilities. So PG&E, Edison, SoCal gas customers. So you might be in a municipal utility market in Southern California, but you take gas service from Southern California gas, you can also get access to this funding as well as customers of PG&E. And so for all public agencies who are an investor owned utility uh, uh, customer, you can get access to this incentive, which at base level will provide funding for roughly 30% of the cost of your new battery project. So it's a substantial uh, incentive. There is a richer resiliency adder incentive for uh, batteries deployed at, at specific designated critical facilities, think emergency operations centers, think fire, think uh, sheriff, police stations. Um, there, there's a whole long list of what are designated as critical facilities. Um, this, along with all of the other qualifiers for this program, have been outlined in our recent article on the subject. And I invite you, you can see here on the screen, the link, terraverde.energy forward slash terrablog, uh, where we've done a, a uh, thorough handling of all of these various qualifications, but for critical facilities that are in high power outage risk areas, so either a designated high fire threat zone or a site that's experienced uh, a public safety power shutoff event, those sites, those critical facilities and those high fire threat areas uh, can see incentives up to roughly 50% of the cost of your battery. And then for Critical facilities that are not only in high fire out or power outage areas, but are also in low income or disadvantaged communities, there is the equity resiliency incentive. The uh, incentives can cover roughly 100% of the cost of your battery project. So again, a lot of moving parts here. Please take a look at our blog. We'll send the link around as a follow-up to this uh, webinar to make sure that you can see where are all of these uh, various qualifiers and where does your agency fall along those lines. But as I mentioned, because of these rich incentive levels, the funding is moving very quickly through this program. Um, as of earlier this week in Edison, uh, San Diego Gas and Electric Territory, there's $18.5 million remaining. That's down over $3.5 million over the last six months. This is one of those categories that has seen less activity than others, but we would say that this is probably a year's left worth of funding before that's wiped out. Um, in Southern California, Edison and SoCal gas territories, we see now just over $25 million remaining. And you can see over the last six months, 12 million of that has, has been drawn down. And so there's roughly six months left for customers in Southern California to get access to this funding. And then lastly, in the PG&E territory, we see uh, $14.5 million available. That was down sub $10 million just a few months ago, but we've seen a lot of projects that were submitted fall out. And so that funding has come back up, but we still think that this is gonna be roughly six months before that funding is fully subscribed. Um, you, you'll recall that richest equity resiliency incentive, the one that pays for 100% of your projects, you'll see in most parts of the state of California, that funding is gone. Uh, with the exception of SoCal gas customers, there's still $35 million left there. We expect that to be gone uh, within the next 12 months or so. So the punchline here is incentives are high, but they're moving fast. So it's important to move swiftly. One last thought for considerations for new projects before we talk about existing project opportunities. Um, California's net energy metering program has been a longstanding program administered by the investor owned utilities governed by the Public Utility Commission. And this is the program that generates the value of solar or battery resources that are installed on customer sites behind meters. And so for solar customers or for battery customers, NEM net energy metering is the program that allows your resource to create value beyond just offsetting your load. Um, so currently proceedings are underway to change this program. We've already seen a substantial change to this program back in 2016-17 
the state moved from the first program, NEM1, to now NEM2, which is the current program available today. And in that transition, we saw a reduction in the value of project opportunities. And so NEM2 is, is far less rich in terms of its uh, benefits to customers than NEM1 was. And we expect a similar reduction in value once NEM3 takes place and is the new kind of order of the day. And so this is expected to launch sometime next year with decisions coming either late this year or early next year. Um, so it's important that customers who are interested in deploying projects do so now, get their interconnection applications submitted now while NEM2 is still available to secure the richest of opportunities through the Net Energy Metering Program. So with that, I'll pass the mic to Ali Chaharishas, who's gonna talk about considerations for agencies with existing solar. All right, thank you, David. Uh, so just a uh, quick background on Terra Verde and our asset management services. We have been, we were founded in 2009 to provide by and large the services that David mentioned, which we boil it down to our work in doing the analytics for deploying solar and battery projects. Uh, we break down everything we do from the physics perspective, then the finance side. Since our foundation, we've been uh, working closely with each of the agencies that have partnered with us to develop solar projects so that we can provide what we call asset management services. And that's to primarily keep an eye out on the systems, uh, view production daily, do performance assessment, take care of the routine maintenance, corrective maintenance, and also every year produce the financial calculations to figure out exactly what the savings were for each agency compared to the projections that were promised. I'm proud to say that we have been working with every customer we've worked with, every agency who's done project with us, uh, and we've been involved with their development of their projects. We're also providing our asset management services to them, so trying to make sure these systems perform. And over the years, as solar has progressed and more agencies have developed projects, either on their own or through the help of uh, other installers or going direct, uh, we've now been a uh, recipient of folks coming to us, asking us to figure out what's going on with their solar PV systems. Are they saving money? Are they not? What's really going on? Can you pull fact from fiction and tell us what do we have? And a lot of the learnings that we've had and some of the items that we're sharing here today in this presentation is coming from these two threads, the agencies we've been working with and the systems we've been operating and projects that come to us post installation and uh, maybe after a few years of operation, and we take a look at those to find out what really is going on under the hood. So with that, we'll jump into the next slide. There are uh, three categories of items I'd like to cover here today. The first category applies to all agencies that have solar, and we want to talk about solar performance issues and retail rate changes. And then from there, we'll take two separate threads. Uh, we'll talk about um, agencies that own their systems and considerations for them in terms of equipment replacement. And then the other thread, which is agencies that have engaged or entered into a power purchase agreement or PPA and the considerations that should be made around their solar rates and the escalators. So first we'll start with the challenges that applies for all agencies that have solar, regardless of the financial arrangement. And there are two topics here to cover. The first one is poor system performance. This is the issue that we've been an advocate of you know, since day one, that installing solar requires continuous monitoring and maintenance to ensure the systems are performing as they should. Solar has this advantage that it can operate quietly without producing much noise or steam coming out of it. There's really not much you can look at physically to tell if your systems are operating. And that's a really good thing because you can put it on your rooftop in your parking lot and it just does what it's supposed to be doing and doesn't produce any issues. However, this advantage is also one of its disadvantages in that you don't have a false, false positive issue or an alarm physically that you can see that tells you the systems are underperforming. 
The way the industry solves for that is by installing performance monitoring and reporting systems, known as PMRS generally in the industry. These systems are available uh, for every project that has gotten installed in California. And in fact, if they were installed by through incentives, um, including the um, California Solar Incentive, uh, you would have had to have been required to install those systems. But those monitoring systems also require somebody to be paying attention to the signal that comes out of them. And in many cases, these systems produce a lot more noise than signal and actually figuring out what's going on with the system tends to be a challenge. The easy part is if the system fully trips and there's no production during the day that does send a signal and folks realize that something is, is going on and they have to go pay attention to it and fix it. The lesser one is the quieter issue, which is the underperformance where the system is producing something, it's not completely out, uh, so no major alarm goes out. It's just an underperformance. And unless somebody's paying attention to the system and, and evaluating whether, given the amount of solar irradiance that's available on that day, is your system producing as much as it should be? And is that delta acceptable or not? Then these issues can go on unnoticed for a very long time. The case you see here in front of you in this screen is a real case that came to us sometime uh, last year, and we looked at the performance of this system, and uh, unfortunately what we realized was that for the majority of the preceding year, the solar system itself had been underperforming because a number of the inverters had tripped, but not everything had tripped, and throughout the end of the year, the performance of the system was only at 5%, but it should have been, and this school district unfortunately was not aware of it until we caught on and, and helped point out the issue. So this is one of the key areas for everyone who has solar to pay attention to. You've installed solar or you've contracted with someone to install solar. There needs to be a consideration of making sure the systems are being tended to and they are being monitored to make sure underperformance doesn't go undetected. The next challenge is another one, which is unfortunately another quieter one until um, folks get into the financials and look at the uh, bill savings truly and, and figure out what the impact has been to their uh, total annual cost reduction because of solar. This issue has to do by and large due to the tremendous success and growth of renewables, primarily solar and wind in the California market. It used to be that the electricity costs in California, speaking from wholesale perspective, uh, were the most expensive during the middle of the day. Um, over time, as more and more solar got deployed and more generation was created in the middle of the day, both from distributed systems that get installed on rooftops and at parking lots, and also wholesale, so in the middle of the desert, uh, where big utility scale solar is deployed, the cost of electricity in the middle of the day started to come down. And that wholesale cost delta took some time before it got reflected on the retail rates that a school, a water agency, or a commercial entity in California pays for it. In the last couple of years, these rate changes have been implemented in all the investor-owned utilities in California, such that the middle of the day price of electricity has been reduced to what's called the off-peak pricing, so the cheapest cost of electricity. And the evening pricing, generally after 4 p.m. Uh, to about 9 p.m., is when the most expensive electricity is required. And that is both reflected on the wholesale market prices and retail. So what does that mean for solar? Solar produces on a beautiful bell curve with the, with the sun rising and setting throughout each day. Majority of the solar production happens to fall within the period where it is now considered to be off-peak pricing. This off-peak pricing now impacts the benefits that solar can produce in order to offset an agency's total electricity bill. And depending on the usage profile, these impacts could be substantial. In one case study that we looked at, as we referenced in here, the annual reduction in savings from 
a solar installation at a district with multiple sites was around $400,000 per year. And to dig into the numbers, this is, again, one of those things that goes quiet unless you do the actual calculations on the financial side, where the terminology, which is referred to as the avoided cost of electricity, otherwise known as solar savings, drops from 30 cents per kilowatt hour to about 22 cents per kilowatt hour. It may not look like much, but when you multiply that over the total system production over a whole year, it adds up to some real substantial numbers. So that's the second issue that applies to all agencies that have solar that we highly advise for folks to pay attention to. Now let's move on into agencies that own their own solar and the consideration we'd like to highlight for you. Solar installations, one of the advantages they have is that uh, the bulk of the production and well, all the production comes from the solar PV panels themselves. These panels, since the commercial solar industry and silicon technology uh, became highly commercialized in the, in the arts, um, have been performing well and by and large, the solar panels that are out there have 25 year plus uh, performance guarantees and warranties. And while they degrade over time, uh, minimally, if they're maintained well, they tend to last for the full life cycle of the systems. Uh, as long as proper maintenance is being done on them, you can always claim a warranty against the occasional panels that may have an electrical issue and don't produce. And those can all be captured through routine testing. The issue that's uh, more important if you own your system is that the inverters, which are the, the boxes that convert the direct current from the solar panels to alternating current, which you can actually use to put into your buildings or feed it back into the grid for credits. Those systems, those technologies tend to last and are warranted for about 10 years. Some of the newer ones may be warranted for 15 and if you're maintaining them well and, and you have a proper part replacement and um, a corrective maintenance approach, you may be able to extend their lives beyond 10 years. But at some point in the life of your solar PV system, you are going to have to replace your inverters as they will fully decommission. The issue that that raises is that the technologies that were uh, deployed um, years ago, when you first installed your projects, are no longer being created today. And the solar industry, like all other technology-based industries, has improved and it's moved beyond the inverters that they used to create uh, back, you know, five, ten years ago. So what that means is that the, there needs to be some assessment, including some engineering done, to figure out the right replacement strategy for removing your old inverters and inserting new ones in. And a lot of times these issues come down to voltage level, wire sizing, orientation and arrangement of the plant. So some level of engineering assessment is required to properly do the replacement. And these projects, because they're being done on as built existing systems, they're kind of like a retrofit of a building. And for anyone who's done any home renovation uh, or you know, office renovation, those costs and costs tend to come in in varying ranges. So figuring out exactly what needs to be replaced, doing the engineering upfront first, producing a set of plans and a strategy that is most effective for your systems, then going out to the market and asking for proposals from uh, recommissioning, repowering companies to come in and replace those inverters is highly advised. Let's move on to the next section. And this is the challenge for agencies that have solar PPAs. The key issue here has to do with your PPA rate and the escalator that is included in your power purchase agreement. By and large, many of these older and existing PPAs that were installed um, you know, five plus years ago would have had some number of an value associated with the rate escalator. What that means is that the power price that you initially signed on to to pay to your provider uh, every year goes up by some number. And in cases we see rate escalators as high as 5%, uh, a lot of the systems that we've seen that were installed years ago have somewhere around three to 4% uh, percent raise. But these numbers, while initially may not add up to much, over a 20 year agreement 
tend to escalate quite a bit. And in many cases, especially with the change in the new time of use rates that have come into effect, at some point, the PPA rate, so the price that you pay for electricity produced by your solar facility that you pay to your provider, goes above and beyond the actual savings, uh, as in the rate that you pay, you would have paid the utility for the electricity you would have bought from the grid. And that's an unfortunate uh, situation for one to, to find themselves in. What's worse is not knowing about it and continuing on to pay the higher solar payment rates uh, while you have other options to consider. In this case that we're showing here, in this example, the PPA rate started somewhere in the range of 21 cent to 23, 24 cent. This was at multiple sites. Each site had their own special rates. The escalator was uniform across all sites at 4.49%. And when you look at the total financial benefit, when we did the calculation for this agency, they were actually coming out net negative overall uh, over the 20 year life cycle of this asset. And that's not a place uh, anyone wants to be. So with that, we'd like to offer a few solutions uh, for agencies that have uh, entered into a solar PPA. One option is Solar PPAs, you have this tagline, they're not forever. There are buyout options that are often included in the agreement themselves. And if not, there's always a negotiation that can be had and a fair market value assessment process that can be done in order to transfer the ownership of that solar asset from the, the provider to the agency, be it a school, a water agency, a city, in one example, uh, we were studying and we actually completed this work for a water agency in Southern California, Edison. Uh, this was a five megawatts or rather large commercial project under a tariff called the Res BCT, which is not important, but that's one of the nuanced uh, tariffs that are available in the market. This agency had a 20 year power purchase agreement and a PPA rate that looked good, 11 cent uh, at a 2% escalator. However, given the economics of this project and the avoided cost calculation that this agency was seeing, they were in the, in the red, they were losing money, and their overall life cycle savings or financial outcome was a negative $19 million. So to help this agency, we evaluated a buyout provision. Uh, we supported them with negotiating a process uh, by which a fair market value assessment was done. This agency had access to capital. Uh, we also found for them a monetization opportunity through the sale of their renewable energy certificates, uh, the RECs, as David mentioned earlier. And we also assessed the opportunity to repower some of their systems that were degraded substantially, but still had some life in them. So by upgrading some wiring and changing some panels, you could actually get more production and more juice out of these uh, systems. Overall, the financial transaction that took place by this agency buying these systems resulted in both an increased bill savings over the life, primarily due to the repowering effort. We were able to secure them a $2.1 million revenue strip through the sale of their renewable energy certificates. And the financial outcome for this uh, investment resulted in an IRR of 7.88%, which is a pretty attractive offering given the fact that this agency under their current PPA was heading towards a loss, but instead they leveraged their solar systems, they invested in buying them out, repowering them, getting a renewable energy certificate contract, and in the end actually return higher capital to the agency themselves. The next scenario has to do with a uh, smaller school district project in a pg and &E territory which we evaluated. And this one has to do with the refinancing of, of their PPA. So the terms here was that this was a 400 kW solar project under a 15 year PPA, 15 cent uh, PPA rate at a 3.75% escalator. Doing the math, given the situation uh, with their system and their avoided costs and their utility rates, they were looking at a loss of $182,000 which seems small, but given the size of the school, this was meaningful loss. The process that we evaluated for them was for them to uh, re-engage a PPA provider and look for another PPA provider for a refinancing of the asset. 
that refinancing entailed an extension of the term of the system, which included repowering and rehabbing of the existing facilities, but also adding a battery energy storage system so it could do the uh, electricity arbitrage, power shifting, load shifting that David mentioned earlier. And the net resulted in a four cent overall PPA reduction and a escalator reduction of 1.75%. Net net, the savings for this project over the next 20 years looks something like 3.5 million. Uh, there were you know, a strip of PPA payments that had to be made. Again, this was a refinancing of the PPA, including repowering and a battery storage addition. But the net projection for this project now goes from a negative to a positive number, uh, which is quite a meaningful savings of about $650,000 for this school. So uh, to wrap up, uh, we started with three categories that we touched on. We'd like to touch on three categories for those of you that have solar systems, either ownership or through a PPA. For everyone that has solar, there are four recommendations that we make. So consider these as call to action to discuss internally, and we're happy to address these with you uh, at another time. Uh, number one, make sure your systems are being monitored and maintained. Um, proper optimized power output is tricky business and it needs to be looked at and it's the first part of uh, managing your systems well. This is the physics part, make sure the systems are producing. Then assess the annual savings and the expected financial impacts from the change in time of use rates. This is the finance part. Just because your systems are producing, uh, it's not clear and it's not a guarantee that those productions are optimized for savings and or are giving you uh, savings. Third, look everywhere for monetization opportunities. Renewable energy certificates are valuable. Uh, the market for these have picked up quite a bit in recent years and a lot of agencies are signing up and securing you know, three to five year rec revenue projections, which is you know, cash that you would have not otherwise had. So it's very important to look at those. Finally, evaluate addition of battery storage, both from a resiliency perspective and also from an energy arbitrage load shifting, which gives you more savings for your systems, especially given the time of use shift that has happened. And the resiliency side of it, this isn't just a feel good that we have backup power, as David mentioned, through use of methodologies like the economic value of resilience, we can actually help you calculate the exact dollar savings that you would have or costs you would avoid by having a backup system that's leveraging solar and enabled by batteries. Agencies that have their own solar, uh, start looking into your inverter replacement plans, uh, identify where you are within that 10 year life cycle of your existing inverters and have a plan or get ready to build a plan for replacing those, retrofitting them so that you can make sure your systems continue to produce well. Agencies that have a solar PPA, um, consider evaluating a PPA buyout or refinancing, especially if you're looking to add battery storage uh, for resiliency or increased savings. Often enough, refinancing and buyout provide you the fastest path to doing this. If you have access to capital, a buyout might be your best option where you can leverage your existing capital that might be uh, sitting in a treasury account to be deployed to return higher returns for you. So there are options available. Uh, the market is changing. The world of solar keeps expanding and new challenges are ahead of us. And each of these challenges provide opportunities that looked at through the right lens can provide vast benefits to agencies. And with that, I pass it back to you, David. Thank you, Ali. And thank you everybody once again for joining. Uh, quite a few questions now coming through the Q&A channel in your Zoom. Uh, interface. We invite each of you to jump in now, type in your questions. We'd love to take the next 15 minutes or so to answer those questions. Uh, before we dive into those, I want to highlight my contact information here. If you have questions about new projects, about existing projects, be happy to continue this discussion one-on-one. -on -one. Feel free to reach out and uh, would love to set up a time to talk about your opportunities and the things that your team's thinking about. So with that, we'll jump into the Q&A. And uh, the first question uh, does Terra Verde promote recircuiting uh, critical circuits only when evaluating battery capacity? So um, I think I'll leave this is getting at you know some 
related questions. When you think about battery and solar resources as a backup power resource, is it a one size fits all approach? I mean, what are the considerations there? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, with backup power solution, it is important to know what do you want the backup power for? So that's part of the exercise uh, for you to understand your critical uh, end use systems or which often translated to critical circuits that might be tied to a panel on site. Uh, we look at these studies from multiple angles. Uh, there's a top down and then there's a bottom up. The top down angle is we look at your uh, electricity usage profile um, if you're a commercial entity, typically we can get those in 15 minute basis and we look at it for a, uh, at least a year long period. We evaluate the uh, financially optimal solar and battery system for your sites for bill savings. And then we apply those systems under a power outage scenario against your load profile. And we run uh, a number of scenarios leveraging a Monte Carlo evaluation where we look at a variety of solar production scenarios, variety of battery status scenarios, and a variety of your usage profile scenarios. So your highest usage day, your lowest usage day. And from there, we produce a, what we call this bin chart where we can tell you the probability of that solar and storage installation to give you a eight hour, 16 hour, 24, 42, or 48, 72 hour uh, backup support. And those probabilities start high at around you know, high 90s percent and they work their way down the longer the outage goes. Um, but that gives you the statistical view of it. The other side of it is we look at it from bottom up and we isolate how much of your building load you want to maintain uh, during an outage. And that's where, you know, with the installation of a automatic transfer switch to circulate the load internally, plus load management software, which will ensure which of your systems stay on, which circuits get uh, triggered off or triggered open, which ones stay closed. We can figure out, you know, what subset of your load can be maintained for how long. And that way we can show you much higher probability of back or power support if it's been isolated to just a few circuits. Thanks, Ali. Uh, question about Rex. So uh, someone wrote in, how do the sale of Rex impact a system's contribution to a jurisdiction's climate or emissions reduction goals? So I think this is an important question, Ali. I'm happy to take this if, you, uh, if you'd like. So um, it's a great question. So renewable energy certificates, because they represent the environmental attributes of your solar generation, if your agency does decide to monetize those RECs, there are specific claim implications now to how you can address your solar projects. To be clear, um, you're not able to claim the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions or the carbon implications of your solar generation once you monetize those RECs. So there is a you know serious or meaningful consideration around um, claims that you're gonna make, whether that's in public reporting or how you're uh, reporting internally or externally about your sustainability as a local government. And so we have a resource that we've developed that brings in some of the guidance from the Federal Trade Commission and from the Environmental Protection Agency, all of which does I think a great job of spelling out what are the ground rules for what is okay and, and not okay to say after you've decided to monetize your RECs. Um, so if you're interested in this particular question, feel free to reach out to me by email. Um, and I'd be happy to send you a copy of that resource. Uh, let's see, an upvoted question here, again about Rex, people are excited about it. Um, will Rex include power from biogas? So um, again, I think I could take this question, Ali. Um, are, so in California and in the Western US, renewable energy certificates are managed through an independent tracking system known as WREGIS. And there's a, an operating guidebook that sets the rules for how different resources can participate. At Terra Verde, our focus in the rec market is exclusively focused around solar. So I don't have a lot of uh, intelligence for you in terms of what does the biogas market look like. If I'm not mistaken, the Regis rules do allow for biogas resources to participate, but at what level and what's the current value of those resources, it's 
um, you know, outside my reach. But if this is your question, uh, I encourage you to reach out to uh, W Regis. If you just type W R E G I S uh, into your Google platform, um, they've got great folks there that can answer your questions specifically. Or feel free to reach out to me by email here, and I can pass along that contact information to you. Uh, a question about refinancing. So uh, the question states, how about the refinancing costs? <laughs> so Ali, how, how would a public agency think about that? Are there costs to refinancing their solar? How would those costs be managed? Um, there's probably multiple threads we can answer this question of uh, refinancing costs. Um, if it's about the assessment that we showed, uh, you know, the net IRR number that was displayed, that was net of all costs involved in the transaction uh, and converting the systems from a power purchase agreement to a agency owned system, which brings with itself um, the cost for ongoing um, maintenance, routine maintenance, corrective maintenance, asset management, uh, so those are costs that as you take over the ownership of the system comes out of your projection of your um, expenses. Uh, but in result, in return, you get to avoid not having to have those PPA payments anymore and all of your bill savings um, are 100% attributed to your own bills. Um, I'm hoping I'm answering the question of what's being asked. I'm not sure if there's other items that, that need to be covered here. Maybe David, is there anything that brings your, in your mind around that? Yeah, I think the question stems around, you know, transaction costs. What about the, you know, engaging a firm like ours and understanding this opportunity? What about a independent engineer's assessment? And I think um, all of that really can get um, assessed on a kind of case by case basis. So. Um, our services in some cases can be paid for through the transaction. Um, so that can be monetized or, you know, baked into the, the refinancing and paid for by the new owner. Um, in many cases, the costs for the fair market valuation are either shared between the, the public agency and the current asset owner. Um, again, those costs could be potentially baked into the transaction. I think that's going to vary on a case by case basis. Uh, but it's certainly something that I think can be explored initially at no cost. And so if this is, you know, something you're considering, please do please reach out to me. I'd be happy to explain to you whether or not there's a path for us to provide. And in many cases, we are able to provide a no cost initial opportunity assessment to guide your thinking as to whether or not this is something your team should prioritize. Yeah. Um, here's another question related to, you know, PPAs that are quote out of the money. Uh, it says, what do the speakers think about the percentage of existing PPAs in California that are, quote, out of the money? So, Ali, what do you think? Oh, um, anything I would say would just be an <laughs> uneducated guess. I mean, this, this market is huge. You know, we've been in the market for or in the California solar behind the meter solar market for 12 years. Uh, we've seen a lot. We have not seen everything that's out there. Um, it, it would be, I think it would be a great study if somebody could do and collect all this information from public agencies, collect the PPA rates and do um, maybe some uh, estimated avoid the cost of electricity to see where we're at. Um, the issue is, I would say, material enough that in the event that uh, a system is upside down in their PPA or out of the money in their PPA, that is worth a serious look and reevaluation. Um, as I mentioned in, in uh, the presentation, and we have a blog post about it too, solar PPAs are not forever. You have a chance and there are mechanisms where you can uh, turn a negative into a positive and really use that solar for what it was meant to do, which is give you low cost, clean electricity, and with addition of batteries, give you reliable power as well. Yeah, thanks, Ali. I think, you know, my response to this would be our engagement with public agencies typically, in a lot of cases, is to help them with their new project cycle. Um, and then in the process of helping them with a the new project cycle, we'll then look at their existing programs and help them discover are there ways to optimize those. And I think there certainly have been cases where those existing programs were well-established and they're well 
kind of in line and generating the expected value. But I would say the majority of cases is the opposite, right? In many cases, there's performance issues. The, the rates that they're being charged are no longer um, you know, set at points that are generating the kind of value that they're perceiving from those projects. So while I don't have a firm percentage, I would say the majority of legacy deals that we've looked at on behalf of our clients do show signs of, of room for improvement, whether on a performance side or on the financial alignment side, you know, PPA rates relative to market value. And so um, it's an important question for you to look at. Um, and, you know, so if you've got some existing solar projects, you're wondering about whether or not your, your resources are in, in alignment, uh, then please do reach out. We would love to, you know, help you think through that. Again, in, in a lot of cases, we can help you provide uh, some initial guidance at no cost. All right, maybe a last question here. Um, going down the policy road, what actions can be taken to influence the Public Utility Commission to keep NEM3 values high? We've seen investor-owned utilities push hard to undermine NEM, even working to put up legislation to end NEM benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, how can investor-owned utilities be motivated to embrace distributed solar benefits? Great question. Yeah, it is uh, a great question. Asking this question, this is great. Uh, David, do you want to take the policy side since you've been yeah. involved with Rick on that? Yeah, so I, I think there's a couple of things that first come to mind. So number one, I think there's been a lot of great work done to quantify the value of distributed energy resources like solar, um, you know, the deferred uh, it, it upgrades to distribution infrastructure, um, the studies of how solar, especially for non-residential projects, of how they typically are uh, better aligned with load. And so the, the value from a grid perspective is substantial. Uh, so I think the further kind of uh, promotion of and kind of uh, broadcasting of these quantified values that have been done and, and whether it's industry groups like the California Solar and Storage Association or it's uh, customer groups that we work with, such as the California Association of School Business Officials or the Association of California Water Agencies. I know the Local Government Commission has been doing excellent work on this as well, um, is, is making sure that uh, the PUC understands that A, these distributed energy resources are generating substantial value on the wholesale market side, and then B, um, you know, promoting the, the need for alignment between the NEM policy and the remainder of the state's policy. So for example, the recent Title 24 decision around commercial buildings requiring solar, uh, which is an excellent push towards uh, sustainably improving our building stock here in California. Well, that policy only makes sense to the degree that the market rules for distributed solar continue to provide that opportunity for peak optimal financial value. And so I think whether it's you know, A, continuing to raise the banner of how much economic value has been delivered by distributed resources to the marketplace of today, or B, speaking to the need for alignment from these policies, both pushing for increased renewables, as well as, you know, how do we handle net energy metered solar? And so those are where my mind goes. I don't know if you have any further thoughts. Uh, no, I think you covered that one really well. I do want to touch on uh, the second part of Nick's question about how can IOUs be motivated to embrace distributed solar benefits. Um, we only have a minute left. I can spend eight hours talking about this. <laughs> uh, what I'll share here is there is a somewhat of a misalignment between the business operations of investor-owned utilities and distributed solar. Uh, Investor-owned utilities recover their costs and their profits through deployment of infrastructure assets, primarily by uh, transmission, distribution, uh, and pipelines if they have gas. The world of solar really plays between the wholesale power markets where electricity is being um, you know, generated, sold, and exchanged to the world of uh, retail rates where customers, agencies pay at the meter to their electricity provider. Fortunately, with the rise of the community choice aggregators, CCAs in California, uh, which the first one was founded uh, here in Marin County, Marin Clean Energy and Sonoma Clean Power followed suit. And now there are 20 plus CCAs, David, in California that 
are driving the missions forward for clean power, cheap power, and local jobs and local generation. Uh, there is a beautiful partnership to be had for working with CCAs that uh, want to produce and promote uh, the use and deployment of distributed solar. We have a exciting program that we've been working with CCAs on called the distributed PPA. Uh, we're working with a number of CCAs now helping them identify which of their tens to hundreds of thousands of customers have load profiles and sites that are suitable for on-site solar and battery storage deployment. Uh, what are the benefits to those customers for deploying these systems? And what are the wholesale market benefits to the CCA for promoting these programs? And by us bridging the gap between the wholesale market benefits and the retail benefits to the customers, we're able to, to work with CCAs to promote these programs to even a broader subset of the California buildings and residents. We have a blog post on this one. I encourage you to take a look at it, give it a read. Maybe David, we can send links around after the webinar. Yep. Um, I think we're out of time now. We are. So with that, thank you, everybody. Again, encourage you to reach out uh, directly if you want to continue the conversation. And uh, it's been a pleasure to have you with us. We'll pass it back to Serena. To, uh, to close us out. Perfect. Thanks so much, David and Ali, for closing out our forum strong. Um, I'd like to give one more shout out to our sponsors, Terra Verde and our, and our other sponsors. And also just remind everyone that today we have our very last event happening just in a couple of hours, our closing plenary. So please do join us at one o'clock for this interactive session. Just one last chance to connect with other participants. And lastly, um, you'll see that John dropped the link for our post session survey in the chat box. Please do fill this out for a chance to win a $50 gift card in a raffle. So we would love to hear your feedback and we're excited to see you in a couple of hours for our last event. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you all.